Welcome and thank you for joining us here at Life Central. If you want to know more about who we are and what we're all about, check out our website, lifecentral.org.za or like, follow and subscribe to our social media channels. We hope this message speaks into your life and that you will find meaning and purpose through it, guiding you through your daily life. There is this moment in the life of Jesus that is captured by one of his followers, a man by the name of Levi, who undertook to, to write a biography of the life of Jesus. And today we are fortunate enough to have that biography. Uh, we call it the book of Matthew or the gospel of Matthew. And there's a specific moment that I'd like to make reference to right here. And, and it's this. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, if you grew up around church, you know this well. You know that Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and then came out. If you didn't grow up around church, you may not, this may all be new to you. Um, but ultimately, I feel like if we grew up around church, so often we just kind of skim past this line because we've just heard it so much. But yet there's such significance within this line for you and for me. Especially in that word wilderness. When we read wilderness or your translation may say desert, the, the, the word that is used there is the word aramos. And aramos really means wilderness or desert or deserted place or desolate place or solitary place quiet place or lonely place and we kind of think that jesus went there came out of that place and that's it he never went back but in reality jesus went back to the aramos on a daily basis in one of the other biographies on the life of Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, we, we see it recorded that it says, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. And that isolated place is the exact same word, Aramos. And the moment that's captured here is literally like hours after Jesus has left the wilderness the first time. So he's just come out of the Aramos and then he goes back in to that isolated place, that deserted place. In fact, in the last of the, of the biographies, in the last of the Gospels, it's one of, his, one of the guys by the name of Luke who who says this, he captures it this way. He says, but Jesus often withdrew. Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness, to the aramos. There's that word again for prayer. Jesus often withdrew to the quiet place, the deserted place for prayer. He often withdrew. Clearly, this was something that was a part of his daily life. And in the Gospel of Luke, we can actually track the life of Jesus. We can actually see that the more popular and the more in demand Jesus became, the more he withdrew and the more he, 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 he went by himself to the lonely place to pray. Now, if I'm honest, my life works the exact opposite way far too often that the busier i become the shorter my time in the aramos becomes the, the the shorter those moments of me going away to be alone just me and god it's like i'm willing to sacrifice those moments to keep up the demand of my ever increasing schedule but yet jesus 
Jesus modeled something so different for you and for me. Jesus models for us that this is what we need more of. We need more time in the quiet place. We need more time with God, just alone, Him and us, when we are stressed and when we are overloaded, not less. The point is this, is that the quiet place was a core practice in the life of Jesus. Throughout the four Gospels, throughout these four biographies that we have access to today, the authors record how Jesus would practice this way of life. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I really love biographies. I love bio biographies. I love reading the life stories of men and women who, who've gone before us. Uh, some of them are still alive. Some of them are, aren't around anymore today. Um, but I love reading biographies. In fact, this past holiday, I read another biography and just, yeah, really enjoyed it. But why do we read biographies? Why do we read the, the life stories of, of people? I mean, let's be honest, we don't know the person. They're complete strangers to us. Or as we said, they're possibly already dead. So why on earth would we read their life story? Well, more often than not, it's not just to know about them, but it's to be like them, especially if they were admirable, especially if they did something really incredible. So we want to be like them. So we read about their lives to copy their success, or maybe they really messed up and we just want to read about their lives so that we can avoid their failures. But either way, in order to do this, we don't just look at what they said or what they did. No, we, we stop and we pay close attention to the details of how they lived. And those details become really important. Those routines that they had, those habits that they had. What was their relationship to money and to food and to exercise? Like, where did they go to school? Where did they study? What neighborhood did they grow up in? What did their relationships with the people around them look like? Then, then we copy the details of their lives and the thinking around this and the hope around this is that maybe if we do this, I'll have the same kind of success. And that's why we read these biographies. I think a modern day tragedy in our day and age is that most followers of Jesus in the Western world today we don't read the four Gospels as biographies. We read them as Bible stories, almost like children's stories, when in reality, they really are the biographies of Jesus. We, do, we don't take the same approach with the life of Jesus as what we would with some other historical figure. The four Gospels, guys and ladies, are filled with the details of Jesus' daily life. Those details like we just read that before daybreak, before it became light the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. And it's these details that teach us how to live just as much as the Sermon on the Mount would teach us how to live. Just as much as that moment where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray would teach us how to live. See, the life rhythms of Jesus have come to be known today as the spiritual disciplines. And you may have heard of the spiritual disciplines before. Um, 
It's known by different names. John Mark Comer refers to them as the practices of Jesus. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton refers to them as the sacred rhythms. And whatever you decide to, to, to call them in your own life, whether they be spiritual disciplines, uh, the practices of Jesus or sacred rhythms, whatever you call them, they are essentially how we follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus, or as John Malcolm puts it, to apprentice under Jesus. I think he got that from Willard. We are ultimately adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. We are copying the details of his life with the attempt to then go and weave that into our own daily lives. This discipline to, or, 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 or this practice that, that we have read here has become to be, be known as the practice of silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. Now, when it comes to silence, silence has two components to it. Ultimately, when it comes to silence, there is an external silence and there's an internal silence. When it comes to external silence, we talk about when we go somewhere quiet, where there's no TV, no radio, no music, no headphones, no noisy roommates or housemates. It's when you're ultimately off somewhere on your own, whether it be up early in the morning or late at night, whether you're out in nature or you're just quietly in a quiet room. Ultimately, quiet all by itself is like a spiritual discipline all on its own. It's this medicine for a hurting heart or a wounded soul. Now, if you've never tried silence, if you've never tried quiet, I so strongly encourage you to give it a go. Just go out and find a quiet place with no one around, no noise, no phone that can interrupt you or steal your attention. Just quiet. And like Jesus, open up your heart and your life to God and see what happens. Then there's an internal silence. And this is far more challenging in the day and age that we live in today. Why? Because we have this endless stream of internal videos that play in our minds. It's this internal video of, of, of all of, of our worries. You know, oh, what, what if this or what if that happened? It's this internal video of, of all our regrets of, you know, uh, how could I have said that? Or how could I have done that? You know, or what was I thinking in that moment? How could I be so silly? It's where we, where we think of all our, those, those grudges that we may have against others, where we face our anger and our hatred or all of our fantasies of the perfect life that we could be living. Oh, if only I was that rich, or if only I was that beautiful, or if only I was that free. Or it's just those goldfish moments where it's like, ooh, a castle. Or I, because oh, I just remembered my shopping list or I just remembered my to-do list or whatever it may be. But you see, silence is when we quiet both the external and the internal noise of life. And we reach a place inside of ourselves where St. John of the Cross called it a silent love, where we literally just come and stand before God. And we stand before His love and in His love and receive His love and express His love back to Him. So that's silence. Then there's solitude. And solitude is when you're alone with, with yourself and with God. Solitude is not the same as isolation 
or loneliness. And I think that's very important for us to pay attention to. In fact, Richard Foster in the Celebrations of Discipline, he wrote this. He wrote, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. There's a big difference there. Uh, I love what Wayne Cordero said, the, the author of Leading on Empty and Jesus, Pure and Simple. There is a difference between isolation and solitude. They may contain similar characteristics, but in reality, they are worlds apart. Solitude is a chosen separation for refining your soul. Isolation is what you crave when you neglect the first. In solitude, it's like you come back into contact with your own soul and with God himself. It's not a place where I feel lonely in any shape or form. Here's a question for you. In your own life, and you don't have to answer this out loud. Maybe just answer it inside of yourself. How often don't you feel like God is distant? Or, or like there is somehow this separation from God. And even though you may instinctively know as a Jesus follower that because of his death, his burial and his resurrection, that, that, that ultimately we are in Christ, you may still feel this odd separation. Now, in reality, there are many reasons for this. Some of them are in our control or, or in our influence, but some of them aren't. But I do believe that one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, that we may feel the separation at times is that God's voice is a whisper, not so much a shout. And it's so easy that, uh, uh, that this whisper in our lives gets drowned out by the constant noise that we face around us all the time. To, to hear that whisper through all the traffic of our lives, whether it be physical traffic or mental traffic, and allowing His voice to penetrate our hearts and our minds. Now, one way of thinking about solitude is to get away from all other inputs, uh, whether it be human inputs, audio inputs, digital inputs, whatever those inputs may be, and just let God and His voice be our only input. And this is where our lives can connect with His life. I love the way that John Mark Comer put it when, when he said this. He said, in silence and solitude, we decompress on a neurobiological and spiritual level from the noise, traffic, to-do lists, and stimulation of a hurry-based modern world. Can you relate to that? In silence and solitude, guys and ladies, we slow down long enough to feel the full range of human emotion. We face the good, the bad, and the ugly of our own hearts. We experience our desire for God or our lack of desire for God. We experience wonder. We experience gratitude. We, con we, we, we experience contentment, joy. We also experience anger and resentment and those hurt feelings and the emotional pain that we may be facing. We, we experience our insecurities. We experience fear. We experience all of the coping mechanisms or addictions that we've used to make it through our week. All of it in that moment is exposed, but it's exposed in a safe place of God's love and His peace. 
in solitude, we have God's voice standing out from all the other voices. We gain His perspective, His point of view for our lives, our calling, and our identity, where we are in a journey with Him. See, it's here. It's here where our successes and our failures start to lose their power over us, start to lose their grip on our emotional well-being. In silence and in solitude, we come home to God. Silence and solitude is probably one of the most important practices of Jesus. Along with, with being in community, this is where most of our spiritual lives are formed and where most of our spiritual lives will happen. If you're struggling right now, if you're struggling in your daily spiritual life, ask yourself, how am I engaged in silence and solitude? How am I engaged in God's community of people? It was Henry Nouwen in The Way of Jesus where he said, Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set time aside to be with God and listen to Him. As you hear that, let's be honest, that's not rocket science. In all honesty, it's true of any relationship, isn't it? I mean, think about it. What would happen to your friendships if you were never alone with those friends? What would happen to your relationship with your child if you were never alone with your child? What would happen for all our married people out there? What would happen to your marriage if you were never alone with your spouse? Truthfully, that relationship would die. And our relationship with God is no different. Now you may be thinking to yourself, Ramon, this is great. I know that somewhere along the line you're going to be asking me what's my next step. And in reality, this is impossible. <laughs> this is absolutely impossible. You see, I have kids. I have kids, so I don't have time. I don't have time to myself. I don't have time for coffee. I don't have time for nothing. Never mind silence and solitude. I have kids or I have a demanding job or I'm an extrovert. And that's just being me by myself is just way too, too hard. You see, guys and ladies, we may feel like there is no way that we can engage in silence and solitude. But I want to ask you, if that's you, if right now those thoughts are going through your mind, then I want to ask you just for a moment to just stop. Just stop for a moment and do this one thing for me. Just take a moment and think about the man or woman that you want to become. Think about that picture that you have in your mind of the person that you want to become. Think about being the loving, caring, compassionate, emotionally and spiritually healthy person that you A, want to be and B, recognize that the people around you need you to be. The truth is that this leads to that. And in the same breath, so easy for us to try and start at point 45. <laughs> It's so important to not try and start where you think you should be, but to start where you honestly are. For now, if you've got five minutes first thing in the morning and for you that's realistic, then hey, do five minutes first thing in the morning. If 10 minutes at night just before you go to bed, like last thing you do in the day is what you can do for now, then do that for now. But I want to say this, start being intentional to walk with Jesus. As we end off this morning, 
an interviewer years ago once, once asked Mother Teresa, he said, what do you say to God when you pray? <laughs> Mother Teresa thought about it for a moment and she looked at him and she said, when I pray, I don't say anything. I listen. The interviewer was thrown by her answer and he wasn't really sure what to do with this answer. And after a few moments of thought, he asked, well, okay, <laughs> then when you pray, <laughs> what does God say to you? Mother Teresa thought for a moment and she answered and she said, he doesn't say anything. He listens. And guys and ladies, for your life and for my life, there's something significant to that. That God is waiting for you and for me in the quiet. I want you to hear that today. That God is waiting for you in the quiet to speak to you and to listen to you in love. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we could just come and be challenged again by a spiritual discipline, Lord, by a practice of Jesus by paying attention to those little things in His life that we could adopt in our own so that we can look more and more like Jesus and live out more and more like Him on a daily basis. Lord, again, I, I pray for courage for men and women as they've listened to this, Lord, that all of us have a million excuses in these moments and they all seem valid. But Father God, I thank you that right now you will come and kind of just expose all our excuses and expose all our reasons why we can't within our own hearts. And Lord, that you will give us the courage and that you will give us the hope to be able to go and implement this simple practice of silence and solitude in our lives. And that as we do, that within you there is a promise where you said that if we seek you, we will find you when we search for you with all our hearts. And I thank you that we can come and in those moments just align our hearts, our minds and our lives with yours. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We really look forward to continuing on this journey with you next week.